This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now. He puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGaulle. The Chris DeGaulle Podcast is presented by USMedicalPlan.com. Save big money monthly and get better health coverage at USMedicalPlan.com. Well, hey there. Welcome in, and thanks a lot for downloading the Chris Stigall Show podcast. So grateful for your five-star reviews and your written reviews at Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you have not followed the newsletter yet, I hope you'll check that out too at Substack. We call it the Harumph Society. I do it three days a week. I think you really enjoy it. Uh, I'm glad you are here, though, and supportive of this podcast. Subscribe so you never miss uh, an episode. And I would also ask you to support the people that make the show possible. If you're a fan, if you like what we do, the people that keep the lights on and keep the things running, our title sponsor in particular, his name is John Ruhlman at usmedicalplan.com. And it's not just self-interest that I ask you to give John Ruhlman a call. It's if you buy your own health insurance and you're probably paying way too much if you've not talked with him, that's almost a certainty, like 30 to 60% too much. One phone call to John's team or log on to usmedicalplan.com. Make sure you see my picture when you go to usmedicalplan.com or you're on the wrong site. But go to usmedicalplan.com or call today, 877-410-4321. Let John and his team go to work. 80 different private health insurers they work with across the country to shop and compare the plan you currently have for your family or if you're a retired person on a fixed income, your supplemental Medicare plan. If you're a small business owner, the plan you use to insure your employees. Are you paying the best rate possible? I don't mean cut rate coverage either. I think a lot of people hear less expensive insurance premium means I lose coverage or I can't work with certain doctors or whatever. Not true. Just take your plan Call John's team or log on to usmedicalplan.com and run it by them. It may be that they say you've got the best possible rate. It, they may. They have. They do. They'll tell you. It, honestly, like, we can't beat that. Keep that plan. That's great. But if you're thinking, man, I pay a lot in monthly premiums. Could I beat this? If you're curious, that's a huge way to save money. I know personally. I have a friend that saved two grand, $2,000 a month for uh, insurance that he needed for his family of four. One of his kids had some particular medical issues and it needed special insurance, John was able to find it so much cheaper through another venue. Pick up the phone, 877-410-4321 or usmedicalplan.com. You know, I told you Democrats are great at flooding the zone, but what I didn't really consider and I probably should have said is it's not just Democrats that have gotten in on the game of flooding the zone. And I I regret that I didn't think about this. This bothers me. I'll, I'll admit they got one by me. I, who typically does not like to get distracted, I do not like non-news stories becoming the news cycle. And I allowed that to happen yesterday. And in doing so, and in fact, you know, after we talked with Congressman Scott Perry, a chair of the House Freedom Caucus, he alluded to it yesterday briefly, but... I was so singularly focused on a couple of things, which are not small things, so I'll give myself a, a wide berth in one sense. We're talking about putting in jail the former president of the United States, and we're talking about a Supreme Court and a federal prosecutor now squaring off, and that could make the difference between whether or not the leading opposition at present to Joe Biden and this chaos that we're living is imprisoned or not. So... I guess I'll ask your forgiveness, but I also sort of understand it from my own perspective that I got, I got distracted thinking about Trump and the Supreme Court. I also got distracted with Hunter Biden running up to Capitol Hill with uh, Captain Douche having his little presser. And the Republicans also successfully distracted me yesterday in passing the House resolution to begin an impeachment inquiry into Hunter Biden. I got distracted by them. The dis the, this doesn't happen. Democrats never distract me, but the Republicans actually distracted me. And I'm so I'm, I'm apologizing. I come to you on bended knee, apologizing to this audience. I failed you yesterday. Not that there was anything that we could have done about it. But yesterday, something happened that uh, Scott 
Perry even brought up in conversation, and again, I was so singularly focused on the aforementioned subjects, I, I kind of glossed over it. And I shouldn't have. Again, not that there was anything we could have done about it. You know what I'm talking about, Fast Eddie? I think I do, because I, I, I fell for it too, man. I did. The defense authorization bill that came out of the Senate, I even had the story in front of me yesterday that the Senate had passed it, but again, it's not that it was going to be stopped. It's not as if you and I had paid enough attention to it, it would have been stopped. But if I'd been smarter... I would have put two and two together yesterday that the Republicans were doing that. How is it? Remember, I made a big deal yesterday. I was instinctively on it. I just didn't know what I was on. I said it is unbelievable and almost impossible that the entirety of the Republican caucus voted uniformly. Every last Republican voted to begin the impeachment inquiry into Hunter Biden. Every last Republican in the House of Representatives doesn't vote for anything. You couldn't get every last Republican in the House of Representatives to vote that the sky is blue. Yet they all voted to begin the impeachment inquiry into Hunter Biden. Why is the question I should have asked. I love to ask the question why, and I didn't yesterday. Here's the answer. The Defense Authorization Act. That's why. These people, (laughs) sorry, I'm trying to be charitable, calling them people, uh, snuck in there yesterday an $886 billion bill loaded with garbage that we'll unpack here in a minute. Um, And they did it under the cover of Supreme Court distraction, Hunter Biden distraction, and The news cycle went along with it, and we missed it. And the Republicans were hoping that you and me would be mollified by launching an impeachment inquiry. It worked. I have to say, I don't know if this is Mike Johnson's smarts. It may be. The new Speaker of the House may be really smart in one sense. He's better at figuring out how to distract. This was an ultimate... Look... Even the greatest quarterbacks get sacked every now and again, and I did yesterday. I'll admit it. I got sacked. These guys pulled a fast one with the blitz. I was on to it with my football analogy. There was a blitz, but the Republicans were part of the blitz too. More than two-thirds of the United States House of Representatives voted in favor of a defense policy bill yesterday that includes $886 billion in annual military spending and authorizes policies like aid for Ukraine and push back against China in the Indo-Pacific. Simon Atiba, remember him, our friend from Africa News Now? He was one of the first journalists actually to scream about this yesterday from the rafters on Twitter. Was this a betrayal of the base, he asks? In case you weren't paying attention, the House of Representatives, under the leadership of Speaker Johnson, passed the defense policy bill. An $886 billion legislation that was stripped of all the demands by Republicans based on abortion, diversity, and transgender rights. Stripped of all those things. The bill calls uh, called the National Defense Authorization Act passed uh, decisive 310 votes to 118 votes already approved by the Senate. The bill includes money for Ukraine, as I said. Warrantless spying on Americans, more importantly. The bill also includes funding abortion and things like sex changes, writes Atiba. The good part, the NDAA covers various aspects of national defense, military partnerships, defense facilities, blah, blah, blah. However, the compromise bill removed many of the so-called culture war provisions proposed by the Republican base. Of note, the bill includes temporary reauthorization of the Section 702 FISA Ordinance, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which extends and expands surveillance of Americans inside the United States, including things like Wi-Fi at coffee shops, libraries, and virtually everywhere else. The NDAA is expected to be signed into law by Joe Biden. Now, look, folks, there was nothing we were going to do to stop it. I'm not under the impression that somehow if we had caught this and seen this coming down the pike and we'd screamed loud enough, we would have stopped them. But... 
I, I, I guess this does have to answer the question now once and for all. A couple of you came at me yesterday on Twitter and you said, well, now, Stigall, where are you on Speaker Johnson, huh? Mr. Give him the benefit of the doubt, huh? I said, as soon as I see him behave in an objectionable manner that causes me to doubt the sincerity of his conservative convictions, I'll let you know. And yesterday seems about as proof positive as it gets that I'm sorry to say Mike Johnson doesn't appear to be any more convicted a Republican leader than any of the others we've seen. I thought maybe he was going to be different. I was willing to give him more than five minutes to see if that was true. And I'm sorry to say it's apparently not true. Some reaction yesterday, Chip Roy, Texas, House Freedom Caucus member, his reaction to the passage of this bill, he opposed it. Is who gets to decide? That's the question. Who gets to make these grand pronouncements of who is going to compromise? Because it sure as hell wasn't any of us. That wasn't the deal. What was tried to be done with FISA was to bring two bills to the floor unamendable, decided only by small groups of people. That's what was occurring. And with respect to this, it was decided by leadership, both sides, to take and jam FISA extension on the back of our men and women in uniform, bring that to the floor in violation of our rules for single subject, and then say, take it or leave it. That was what was done. That was the compromise. See. If you poke the bear in this town, right, they don't like to be poked because it changes the way this town works, heaven forbid, because it's been going so well, so beautifully, that we have $34 trillion in debt and that we have rampant spying on the American people that is occurring. In 2020 and early 21, the FBI conducted 278,000 improper searches of Americans, according to the 2022 Fisk report. We're just supposed to trust the FBI has fixed that. In June of 2022, an FBI analyst conducted four queries of Section 702 information using the last names of a United States senator and a state senator based on information that a foreign intelligence service was targeting those individuals. We have rampant abuses going on, and this body is just going to extend the very mechanism of those abuses on the back of the National Defense Authorization Act and say, have a nice day, Merry Christmas, go home and have your turkey, go home and be with your families. That's what's actually occurring. Yeah, by the way, there were only 13 Republicans in the Senate that opposed this too. So it's not as though an overwhelming majority of Senate Republicans opposed it either. They passed it the day prior, 87 to 13. So I don't know. What do you say here? The Republican Party is effed. Hungary yesterday, (laughs) the nation of. European leaders could not reach an agreement on giving more aid to Ukraine. They're ticked off that we didn't rubber stamp ours first. Not kidding. Europe folded its arms and said, well, we're not going to give to Ukraine if the United States doesn't do it first. (laughs) I mean, I guess I can't blame them in one sense, although Lord knows we've certainly given tenfold anything Europe's given in this endeavor. European leaders could not reach an agreement on a $54 billion aid package. EU leaders held a summit focused on Ukraine starting yesterday in Brussels. We still have some time. Ukraine is not out of money in the next weeks, said uh, the Dutch prime minister to Reuters, who runs the EU there. He added that Hungary was the only EU member state not going along with the deal, which will be considered again next month. The emergency spending request here, as you know, in the United States was... The brakes were pumped by Speaker Johnson. However, the figure in the Defense Authorization Act that was tucked in there, there was one measure. Through the end of 2026, it authorizes $300 million for something called the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. So, Fast Eddie, if you're tracking what was just passed yesterday, the Defense Authorization Act has $300 million that will continue to be paid to Ukraine through the end of thir- uh, 2026. Uh, but but uh, Reuters wants you to know that's a tiny, tiny fraction of what Ukraine actually wants. And so basically, even though we said we weren't going to just 
blank checked Ukraine. We kind of blank checked Ukraine, but Reuters wants you to know it's not nearly the sizable blank check that Ukraine wanted. So we refused to help Ukraine, but we kind of helped Ukraine, but really not as good as we could have. And so if you're if you're following all that, the Republicans voted to fund aid to Ukraine, but not to the level that Joe Biden and Ukraine wanted, I guess. Okay, cool. So, yes. so that means that the Senate then had the fight about the border before they signed the NDAA. Okay, cool. thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. it's just, uh, folks, I don't know. I guess I don't know what else to tell you. Um, I'm not going to tell you I was snowed by Johnson. I mean, I guess there's some people. Well, you see, Stigall? Ha, see? Johnson's a no-good SOB sellout just like every other Republican. I'm not sure where I gave anybody the impression that I was some sort of Johnson enthusiast. I literally can't remember the man's name. I mean, I, I don't know him. I don't know anything about Mike Johnson. So I couldn't vouch for his conservative bona fides uh, that he just kind of rubber stamped this and let this go. And the fact that it came on the heels of the Biden, the Hunter Biden um, impeachment inquiry, or I should say Joe Biden impeachment inquiry, I, that leads me to believe that we were snowed. What he's what he's very good at doing clearly is trying to distract you. Here is Steve Bannon yesterday with his reaction to this on his show. The NDA just passed. It just passed. This is Mike Johnson. And don't tell me you're a Christian. I don't want to hear you're a Christian. Don't wear your faith. Don't give me the Bible. I don't hear more Bible verse. When you've allowed the transgender, you've allowed all that garbage, all that tra demonic trash throughout the defense budget that you wonder why you wonder why you can't get you wonder why you can't get uh that you can't get uh kids you know red-blooded american boys and girls to get into the military with what you've done in this neo-marxism and this cultural rot that now you have taxpayers paying for in almost a trillion dollars and you allowed this to happen when the commitment the commitment if you can't get the majority the majority doesn't go to the floor the hazard rule but you waive that to get this there because you're playing footsie with Mitch McConnell, Schumer, and you're just as bad as the bun guys because you should know better. So I don't need to hear any more biblical review, okay? I saw in action. Pretty harsh. I don't want to hear you call yourself a Christian anymore after passing this NDA, says Steve Bannon. Whoa. Okay, um, well, I'll let you sort that out. I don't have much more to add. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chris, t taxpayers will be funding transgender surgeries now. Like, that's, that's insane. That's something we heard about in Tom Wolf's first term that he was trying to do in Pennsylvania. It's just like, okay, well, we laughing it off. It's just like, ah, it's just stuff coming from California. No, it's a reality now yeah. in the United States military. Yeah, I'm kind of at a loss. I don't I don't have anything clever to say to you about it. I, I can't I can't explain it. I can't excuse it. Uh, it seems to be more of the same. I, I get you know Kevin McCarthy gave his farewell address yesterday on the floor. <laughs> Why not? Um, to the constituents, thank you. Thank you for ever giving me this opportunity to serve you. Um, to America, I loved every single day. Less than 13,000 people have ever been given the privilege or the honor to serve in this body. Yeah. To those colleagues on the other side of the aisle, oh. I thank you for the work you've done. I won't miss that. We may disagree at times. I disagreed with the vote on this one, too. But one thing I think we must quite understand. Who talks and if there's like advice this? I can give. Do not be fearful if you believe your philosophy brings people more freedom. Do not be fearful that you could lose your job over it. I knew the day we decided to make sure to choose to pay our troops while war was breaking out instead of shutting down was the right decision. Yeah, okay. So he goes out a great well, hero. Stand, uh, stand your ground, stand by your principles is his outgoing speech. On the same day they pass this. 
That's his last. By the way, this is Kevin McCarthy's last vote in the House of Representatives. Isn't that fitting? (sighs) (sighs) He's side defeatedly. Not much of an opposition. So, folks, um, the House of Representatives is all but gone, just so you understand that. it's um, I, I know you do, but I, I think that this probably puts to bed any idea that they're, they're going to have a prayer of maintaining control of the House next fall. I don't see it. You got a Supreme Court in New York that's rejiggering their map, just as Pennsylvania did, to cut another Republican district out of the New York map. So... Uh, you, you have several that have resigned. It's hell. It wouldn't surprise me if by spring, Democrats actually do control the House of Representatives because Republicans are just resigning right and left now. So you, the, the the party is in full sellout and or retreat at this point in the House, and I'm not I'm not sure what to tell you about that. You're not in retreat. I'm not in retreat, but it may be. I I never used to be one of these third party guys. This is where you start to see a guy like. RFK Jr. duping people. There are going to be a lot of Republican voters who aren't, I'm just sorry to say, aren't sophisticated enough to understand that being let down by the Republicans does not mean that RFK Jr. is the option. You understand? RFK Jr. is not the option of this, okay? So when you start getting Ross Perot excited about a third party, please don't get excited about RFK Jr. as the answer. That's not the answer here. I don't, I don't have the answer. I don't know what Congress looks like in opposition to this party. Um, it's not the Democrats. But I, I saw so many people on social media yesterday saying, that's it, I'm not, I'm not even going to support my Republican member of Congress in the next go-around. I'm just not, I'm not participating. I'm voting Trump, and that's it. Uh, I, can't, I can't be mad at you for it. I can't be mad at you feeling that way. This is hard to defend. This clearly smacks of a group of people that just want to get to the finish line and get to Christmas and get the hell out of there. And they tried to offer up impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden as a distraction to um, uh, ameliorate you, distract you, and try to make you feel better about what they just did, which was betray you. And, you know, you have to ask. I, I don't know. I'd love to have, if I had somebody like Matt Gates here this morning, I'd love to ask him, so what was achieved by ousting Kevin McCarthy, I guess? What is this? What is this Speaker Johnson overseeing this NDAA? What was achieved here? What was all this upheaval? What was all the fighting? What was it for? I mean, if we were ultimately going to end up here, then we could have at least just kept McCarthy. It would have spared us that ridiculous goodbye speech and... You know, he would have stayed, and he would have been, I guess, at least sometimes a Republican vote. Now he's leaving. Like I don't, I, um, I have to say, I, I was willing to be patient and see this through, and now it seems I have to tell you, I, if I'm just going to be objectively honest, I'm not sure how anything's better. This does feel like things just got worse in the House of Representatives somehow which is impossible to believe almost, but it seems it's gotten worse. So anyway, folks, that's that. Uh, sorry to start on a downer. Uh, I don't, I, I wish I had a pep talk for you on it. I don't, I wish I could show you a silver lining. I wish I could tell you there was some smarts behind it. I wish I could give you some insights and say, no, 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 there's a long ball strategy here. I don't, I don't see it. This just looks like typical Washington doing what typical Washington does. Okay, it's time to start thinking about your financial future. Never too early. Here we are in early 2023. What are your goals? Have you visited your financial situation with a pro that knows what they're doing, making plans for your future yet? Well, if you haven't, may I recommend Jason Perrett to you. Jason is a financial advisor at Eagle Wealth Planning, and he wanted me to talk with you in this audience. He values this audience. He's a listener of this podcast, and... He said, I want to reach your audience. I want to help them plan their financial future, providing financial services to people who want to truly achieve financial independence, and he doesn't care where you are. If you are a uh, accomplished entrepreneur, if you're a, a professional, a retiree, even if you're a young person and you just want to start 
the lifelong goal of financial independence and you don't quite know where to get started, Jason can do that for you. He's a fiduciary. He's dedicated to providing clients with complete wealth management and investment services along with highly personalized professional assistance. Jason will regularly revisit your plan, and that's one of the key things about this business is regularly checking in and assessing where things are, making sure you're on track, assessing assessing your risk tolerance strategies to provide you the high level of service that you would expect from someone in this position. And you can call him anytime you'd like, 816-394-8117. He's extremely available and accessible at all times, 816 394 8117. That's Jason Perrett, financial advisor at Eagle Wealth Planning, 1717 Paddock Drive in Kearney, Missouri. It doesn't matter where you live in the country. If you're listening to my voice and you need some help with financial planning, you want somebody that you know uh, you're going to be on board with, you know, because you listen to this show, Jason's your man. All right. So it's Jason at EagleWealthPlanning.com. His website is linked on mine at ChrisStigall.com if you'd like to go there and link up. Securities and advisory services offered through Satera Advisors, LLC, member FINRA, SIPC, a broker-dealer, and a registered investment advisor. Satera is under separate ownership from any other named entity. I don't know how else to put it, and I, I really hate to rub salt in wounds because I know this ticks off so many people in this audience, But I, it, it, and I know it almost sounds tired and cliched at this point, but the Republican Party cannot amass the passion and the fight in the American electorate, the way a guy like Donald Trump can. And it's not easy. Many, most people in politics can't amass the kind of loyalty and the willingness to fight as Donald Trump can. A huge swath of this country believes that Donald Trump will fight for them. And so those of you that say, I just don't understand, he's about to be thrown in prison. Half the country hates him. There's no way he can win. I don't know why people are being so stupid and blindly loyal to him. Because whether you believe it or not, or whether you think it's sincere or not, the impression millions of Americans have is that Donald Trump cares about the country and is willing to fight for it. The Republican Party at large does not leave voters with that impression. And so how do you explain that so many Republicans barely hang on and so many Republicans lose elections. How do you explain it? Because voters don't trust the brand. Half the voters hate it, and the other half of us who vote for it don't trust it. So we're not particularly enthused to turn out for it. That's a problem if you're the Republican Party, isn't it? You have a brand problem. Half the country hates you, the other half doesn't trust you? I mean, at least the Democrat Party, as destructive as they are, and as much as we can't stand them, their voters know one thing is certain. The Democrat Party knows they will always deliver. When they elect Democrats, the Democrat Party will deliver what they sent them to do. If that means hate Israel, that's what they'll do. If that means make men women, that's what they'll do. If that means banish Israel, Uh, People of faith from the public square, that's what they'll do. If that means increased government spending, that's what Democrats will do. Can you think of an issue, and I'm serious, can you think of a single issue Democrats, when they vote for other Democrats, don't get in return? Do Democrats ever not deliver for their own party? Sincere question. Can you name a time? Can you think of a thing your, your Democrat family or friends have said to you, you know... I'm getting so tired of voting for these Democrats. Every time I vote for them, they win elections, and then they just fail us. Do you ever hear Democrats say that about themselves? I don't. So, yeah, Michael tweeted. He said, well, now I'm depressed, Stigall. You've totally bummed me out. I'm not trying to dispirit and depress you. I, you know, you gotta, we have no choice but to continue to, to soldier on here. Uh, I I had just, I guess I'd held out hope that Speaker Johnson was going to be different. I'd held out hope that they were going to use and flex their ability to hold this stuff up a little bit. But it turns out uh, when it's all said and done, these guys just want to hightail that out of town as fast as they can. They got a Christmas break coming up. They don't want to stick around. And I remind you that it's this time of year, several years ago, that Democrats were willing to hang out and pass something that most of the country hated in a snowstorm, literally, on Christmas Eve. 
I've never, you know, as long as I live, I will never get over that the Democrats stuck around on Christmas Eve in a snowstorm to pass Obamacare. That's how committed Democrats are. That's what I mean. That's what they'll do. That's what they're willing to do. They will stay on one of the most sacred, holy days of the calendar year. They will stay in a snowstorm to pass something most of the country didn't want. Republicans, they'll rubber stamp whatever they got to do to pack up their bags and get the hell out of town for their Christmas vacation. And that is the fundamental difference between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats will stand in the middle of the highway and tie up traffic. That's what they did yesterday, again. Those of you not in the immediate Philadelphia area, you may have seen that they tied up the Schuylkill westbound coming out of Center City yesterday. A bunch of pro-Hamas protesters standing on the overpass, standing in the middle of the Schuylkill, literally smack dab in the middle of the Schuylkill. That is the major thoroughfare through the city. For those of you that don't know it, 76, headed westbound out of the city. You had, I don't know how many, 50, 60, 50 to 100 protesters just standing in a line in the middle of the highway, not allowing traffic to pass in the middle of drive time. This is how committed they are. Destruction, chaos, anarchy, they're committed. Uh, Our representatives apparently don't seem to think you're serious or don't think they've got to be that committed. You know, I guess the the thing that our members of Congress uh, can take comfort in is that you and I work uh, and you and I are raising our families and being productive and we don't have time to go stand in the middle of the street or throw things at them or scream and swear and protest. Uh, Is that it? That's all I can figure is the Republican Party isn't afraid of you. The Democrat Party is afraid of their voters because they're animals. Is that it? Maybe that's it. Is it that simple? Democrats are maybe literally afraid they'll be assassinated if they don't behave with the people that vote for them. But unfortunately, because some of us have got to go out there and earn a living to pay all of these exorbitant taxes that they spend, uh, we're the productive half of society in this country, and they know it, so they can continue to beat us about the head and neck. And we'll like it because we're too busy trying to be productive and protect our families and homes and towns. That must be it. Not that I'm suggesting we become like Democrats and stand in the middle of the highway or throw things or whatever. But uh, And mind you, the one time you got uppity, January 6th, that's been treated as a national scandal for two years. As we know, that's how Democrats behave at least monthly, over whatever issue, gender, race, doesn't matter. Democrats will destroy cities, burn and loot on any given week just because they feel like it. Everybody got to eat. Democrats excuse it. Democrat voters applaud it. Got to give them the space to destroy. You got to understand their anger. You and I just have to keep getting the back of the hand and going to work and raising our families and being responsible and just taking the abuse. Okay, fellow Harumphers and podcast listeners, my friends at gulagamerica.com want to invite you in to celebrate Christmas and Happy New Year with a big discount on all their stuff. Great stuff. Have you been to gulagamerica.com yet? There are newest sponsors. A woman wrote me on Facebook the other day. She said, how do you spell that? Okay, I didn't consider some people might need to look it up. G-U-L-A-G, G-U-L-A-G, gulagamerica.com to help you celebrate the holidays uh, in this period of inflation and even into the new year, gulagamerica.com is giving you a big discount if you use my promo code when you shop. You'll take 20% off all apparel orders at their online store if you use the promo code CHRIS20. That's CHRIS20 when you check out. All right, and they're keeping this sale extended through January 6th. All right, so again, it's promo code CHRIS20. The sale extends till till January 6th at gulagamerica.com. Really funny graphic tees and hoodies. Um, There's there's a newer one that says, I've been, um, I went to re-education camp and all I got was this totally awesome t-shirt. I love that. My particular favorite, uh, and it's one that I had a friend actually ask, hey, can I get my hands on some of those? 
I'm going to have to buy a couple for my buddy. The the GFY, the vintage looking, it's a parody logo. You'll have to see it online at gulagamerica.com. The GFY with STFU treatment. It's a, I'm, now I'm, it's escaping me, the name brand that it's parodying. It's like a motor oil, I think. GFY. That's a, an homage to um, Elon Musk's big speech uh, at the that, that symposium where he told Bob Iger of Disney to go F himself. Anyway, they made that into a shirt, like they do so many great things at gulagamerica.com. you got to see some of these stuff. I love them. Or if you need a great last-minute gift, gulagamerica.com gift cards are also an option. If you'd like, uh, you know somebody would really like these, that's what I might do. I might just give my buddy a gift card from gulagamerica.com so he can order the size that he wants. You can also print on demand. So there's no discount on the purchase of a gift card, but I do want you to know, otherwise, Chris20 is your discount for the apparel you shop online, okay? 20% off straight through the 6th of January. And we thank our friends at gulagamerica.com for being great sponsors and friends and founding harumphers. And as they always say at Gulag America, it's not their wish, it's their warning. I don't know how long, I must say, I, I don't know how long that continues, that dynamic. This is why I say I worry very much about people being successful in jailing Donald Trump. I really do worry a lot about that, I must say. I spend time thinking about what happens if they successfully jail this president, this former president. And I think that that might be, I'll just, I'll just say to you that I think that that might be a moment that this country finally um, sees the other side awaken in a way they're not going to like. I, I, I hope I'm wrong about all of it. I hope none of that happens. But I could easily see it and understand it. You want to talk about the space to destroy. How long can the civilized, functioning, um, productive half of this country, how long can we continue to take this? How long can you continue to take the horror show that we're living? How long, how long can we take it? How long can we take racist, plagiarist presidents of Harvard? How long can we take our girls competing and dressing in locker rooms with men pretending to be women? How long can we take this? How long can we take this open hostility to our faith? I ask myself that question all the time. It's, it's a rhetorical one. It doesn't have an answer. I just wonder, what's the breaking point? How long can we take it? How long can you take it that you're called pro-Putin? If you ask the question, why are we spending so much money in Ukraine? And what does victory look like? How long are we supposed to take racially segregated holiday parties? Did you hear about that? I didn't even talk about that yesterday. The mayor of Boston had a no whites allowed Christmas party this week. How long are we supposed to tolerate that? Another school board member swore themselves in on a stack of children's books with dirty pictures and sexualized themes in it instead of the Bible. How long are we supposed to take it? How long are we supposed to take a wide open border? Drag queen shows. Limitless printing of money. That helter-skelter Christmas show, the first lady put on at the White House yesterday. You've probably seen that video flying around. I don't know what the hell that was. Performed by some dance troupe that's, of course, steeped in racial justice. I don't know how long good people of this country just tolerate this while the left thrashes and writhes and throws tantrums and destroys and you and I go about our day and raise our kids and go to work and be productive and try to be polite members of society. I don't know when the rest of us turn and say to hell with it. I'm not sure. 
I don't I don't want to see that. I don't want to be here to see that. I'm just wondering how long it lasts. President Biden's job approval finds a new low before the new year. This from Town Hall. Just how low can Joe Biden's approval rating go? According to Pew Research's tracking of Americans' approval for this husk who we're pretending is president, the floor has yet to be found. The latest survey pins approval at just 33%. That is a five-point slide from the beginning of this year. It is 21 points down from when he took office. The math on that is two-thirds of Americans, 64% disapprove of his performance as, air quotes, president. Meanwhile, the Daily Caller, former President Trump dominating in several crucial battleground states. I know a lot of you don't believe these polls. I'm just sharing them with you. Morning Consult Bloomberg survey said yesterday in a head-to-head rematch with Biden. Ready for these numbers? Again, Bloomberg Morning Consult. Uh, Trump leading Biden 47-42. In Arizona, Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Nevada, North Carolina. The former president held his largest leads against Biden in North Carolina and Georgia by nine points and six points, respectively. Trump's smallest margin of victory came in Pennsylvania by two. The former president is up by four points against Biden in Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, secured a three-point lead in Nevada. Trump campaign spokesman Steve Chung told the Daily Caller that President Trump is dominating every single poll in the primary and the general. It's time for everyone to drop out, coalesce around Trump, because every second and every dollar spent otherwise is doing nothing more than helping crooked Joe Biden. There are people very confident that DeSantis may still surge and win Iowa. That may well be. I don't know. Not making predictions, certainly. You can't predict Iowa. Independent candidates on the ballot. This is interesting in particular. We talk about the lack of RFK Jr. being considered here. You know, RFK has been saying he believes that he takes votes from Trump. Well, you put RFK Jr. on the ballot with Biden and Trump, according to Morning Consult Bloomberg anyway. Trump widens his lead over Biden. In seven battleground states. He widens the lead by seven points, according to this poll. So. Is what it is. Um, That's. I'm not telling you to swear by it by any means, folks. I'm just sharing with you the news as we see it. 20 years in business. Congratulations to Mike Lindell and my pillow. 80 million Pillows sold over those 20 years. Can you believe that number? Well, Mike and his team at MyPillow, they want to thank each and every one of you for giving them such success over these many years. And now they want to celebrate by giving you the lowest price in MyPillow history. He told me that if you call or log on to MyPillow.com or call them today, you'll get a queen-size MyPillow to celebrate their 20 years in business for just $19.98. 20 years and just about 20 bucks with tax. How about that? $19.98, that's it, for a queen-size MyPillow. Do you know the regular price of this thing is almost $50 more? So you're talking about a $50 discount. By the way, for the king size, you'll get it for just $10 more, $29.98. It's a huge sale. And incidentally, in addition to these pillows that are deeply discounted right now, you go to MyPillow.com and you'll get a discount using my name, Chris Podcast. Use that as your promo promo code, Chris Podcast. Click on the uh, radio listener square and enter that. And you're talking about mattress toppers, pet beds, mattresses, my slippers, sheets, and, of course, the pillows, so much more. You can try it on. If if, uh, if ever you've gone to MyPillow.com and you've thought to yourself, eh, maybe uh, it's a little expensive, now's the time. Celebrate 20 years with Mike Lindell. And know this, 10-day, or excuse me, 10-year warranty. 10 years they warranty these things. So if they ever wear out or you have trouble, you can exchange for brand new. 60 days they let you take this stuff home, and if you don't like it, you can send it back for a full refund. So you got nothing to lose but a great night's sleep on my pillow products. I have colleagues I've sent these my slippers to. They love them. Christine loves hers. The sheets are comfortable. The towels are super absorbent. Even old Dean loves his dog bed. And we drink my coffee here 
at the office every day. I just brewed some this morning. MyPillow.com, promo code Chris Podcast. all right? With that warranty fully intact, or call 800-932-5056. 800-932-5056, promo code Chris Podcast. Or MyPillow.com, promo code Chris Podcast, if you please to save. She is the host of the wildly popular podcast, a part of the Salem Podcast Network family. I'm proud to call her friend and colleague, Michelle Tafoya. I, there were a couple of stories that landed in our stack that I, I said, Eddie, we got to get Michelle back to talk about these. And I was so glad she could make some time for us before Christmas. And I, I know it's a busy time. Michelle, welcome back to the show. Good to talk to you, and happy holidays, Merry Christmas, all of it. Um, the podcast, by the way, is still going strong. I hope people subscribe to it and, and listen. How have you enjoyed doing it? I, I enjoy it a lot. I've met so many interesting people. It's, <laughs> it is so fun to get perspectives from all over the globe, all over the map. Every Just every viewpoint is what we're trying to get. I, I wish that there were some more brave liberals who would come on the show um that seems to be a sticking point they don't seem to want to talk to me is that a fact because they just assume what you're a dyed in the wool conservative and they don't want the debate i mean i know you'd be friendly I, I, right uh, absolutely we are a friendly podcast i mean we are serious about civil debate but no we haven't we haven't had any uh any takers I know you probably get this question a lot, but I'm, I am curious. If you could, um, if there was one guest you could land right now, who who would you most like to interview right now? You know, the first name that comes to mind is Elon Musk. Yeah. Um, I, I think he's just been, he's a an historical figure, and he is changing the world in so many ways. And I think he's an interesting guy, and I think there are a lot of facets to his personality that maybe – misunderstood or that may be uh, different than we actually think they are. So I'd love to dig in with him. The uh, Michelle Tafoya podcast, subscribe to it so that you don't miss it. Um, Each one is a great conversation. I I wanted to reach out. The the news is a bit old on one of the stories, but I thought of you the minute I read it and heard it, and I know you've done other interviews with other folks about it. So apologies for being late to the the story with you. But uh, I still had to pick your brain about this headline from a couple weeks ago that uh, Carissa Thompson, I don't know if you have a relationship with her or not, she's an NFL reporter, and she said that she made up, she used to make up fake sideline reports. And I thought this was sort of more broadly a story about journalism in general, not so much about her. Um, So I was just curious what you thought about it. Well, I do know Carissa, um, and I like her very much as a human being. She's a very nice person. I was pretty surprised when she made this statement um, and pretty surprised that it actually happened because it, it doesn't have to be that way. If you cannot get a coach at halftime, there's another way to approach it. You can say simply the coach wouldn't speak to us at halftime, but based on what he told us before the game, you know, they, they need to do this better. They need to shore this up. It, it's, it doesn't have to be, complicated so and then she came out and sort of doubled down on well i didn't actually say what you heard me say um when she apologized so i think she was misguided uh and i feel for her because it's it's a mess um it, i it, uh, clearly she's withstanding it she's still hosting the pregame show on amazon and she's still doing all her work on fox on sunday so it's not as though uh she's going to be fired and uh, but i will tell you this The Amazon product is owned by Jeff Bezos, who also owns the Washington Post. (laughs) And if you're suggesting that it's okay to make stuff up and you're the owner of the Washington Post and you're standing with that, I don't know. It sends an interesting signal. It sure does. And I I do. I really do think. I mean, when I heard it, I I think a lot of people dismissed it, quite frankly, Michelle, because it's – sports and so they think well that's not uh, necessarily all that consequential you make up a quote about us a, a coach at halftime uh, eh, the world's not going to end is sort of i think the cavalier attitude but the broader yeah. sort of thirty thousand foot view is well what else are you making up i think i think if if one person one person in the vast universe of reporters out there in the world whether it's sports or business or what what have you is willing to admit that they made stuff up because they didn't have the information they needed. Um, yeah, I think you could extrapolate rather fairly that other people are doing it and maybe it's outside of sports. So, you know, I, and, and 
I think we've seen so many examples of what what Donald Trump has coined as fake news. And that has now become a sort of a, an iconic uh, title in this country. Um, we, we've seen it in other places. So this was someone admitting to it. The other part that bothered me, and this was sort of the, the second level of the story, those of us who work really and have worked really, really hard at, at doing the right thing, at doing the job right for so many years in a position where women weren't initially respected in that role, um, and we're often chastised that they're just a, a little sideshow uh, on the sideline. Those of us that worked really, really hard to do the job well felt like, really, you're just, you, you know, now you're just giving people ammunition to say that this job isn't that important. And of course, if we criticized it, then we were called bullies. Uh, or, or as one person said to me, you know, it's not like you're Woodward and Bernstein out there. Just give it a rest. And I thought, you're missing the point. M- Michelle Tafoya's uh, podcast, uh, subscribe to it right now, the Michelle Tafoya podcast on the Salem Podcast Network. She's, she discusses things like this and much, much more news and great, uh, interesting interviews, too. Your work, your time uh, as a sideline reporter and a journalist with NBC Sports, um, I'm just curious about it generally. Is that commonplace that you would have trouble securing a quick comment or an interview from a coach? And if so, like you said, that's how you'd handle it at, at the half, what they'd throw to you on the sideline and... and you know, for, for commentary and you didn't get something? Is that what you'd tell producers or tell the hosts if you're live on the air? You know, all the time that I worked on Monday night and Sunday night football, I would arrange with the coaches before the game. I'd love to talk to you as you walk off the field at halftime, or I'd love to talk to you as you come out of the locker back room back onto the field at halftime. So there was an arrangement. It was, it was predetermined when and where we would speak. And so there were very, very few coaches who, who said no to that. Very, very few. Um, I can think of one, and I'm not going to finger him because he's a friend of mine. So, um, and, and he, but he did have a sort of a, um, this template of, well, if we're tied or winning, I'll talk to you. But if we're losing, I, I don't want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. But it was understood. So if he was losing, and I knew I wasn't going to get this particular coach, I would say, this coach had no comment for us, but, you know, I, you'd come up with a nugget, something you observed. There are also times where you could just say, I talked to both coaches. You tell your producer, I talked to both coaches. Neither of them had much to say. So you, you maybe didn't file that halftime report, or you came up with a different angle, a different approach to doing your halftime report. You don't just throw stuff together uh, that, that you think is benign and isn't going to hurt anyone, but that is just sort of made up. You just don't do that. Does that cut into your airtime out of curiosity? I mean, I wonder if cynically you're thinking to yourself, if I say I don't have anything, could that mean I'm cut out of the broadcast a little bit? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And and yeah, and you're down there and you're working your tail off all week and all night and you're thinking, I, <laughs> this is one of the few times I know I'm going to get airtime, which is half time. Certainly. But the other way I thought of it was, if this is one of the few times I'm going to get airtime during this game, it better be something good and worthwhile and worth the time. I, I you know, I, I, yes, we all want to have our airtime, but you want to do it with integrity. And you always did. As far as I know, I mean, everything I've ever watched, and I, I know, you know those of us who love watching football, you've always done it so well, and you did it for so many years so well with Al Michaels. And the real reason I wanted to talk to you today was a story that broke this week that uh, Al Michaels will not be doing NBC's NFL playoff coverage, and it sounds like there's some pretty open-air consternation about it. And I just thought, since you'd worked with him for so many years and worked for NBC specifically, if you had any thoughts about Al Michaels and his moves. I, you know, I, I know he's, you know, I, I don't don't mean to make it a matter of age. He's a mature fella. He's pushing 80, right, or is 80. Um, but he's, I think he's still just as talented as he's ever been. Um, but there seems to be this implication that, he wasn't flashy enough last season during you know big moments, and I I mean now we're getting to a style thing that I just think um, <laughs> we could debate. But anyway, what do you know? Yeah, well, okay. So it, 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 truth be told, I spoke to Al after this news came out, and he was as cheerful as could be. He kind of said, "Look, you know what? This is a move that they wanted to make," and um, I, he was he was just fine with it. He's coming back to do Amazon next year. Here's the deal. They also have a young guy named Noah Eagle, 
whose dad is Ian Eagle, who is with CBS. And I think he's still with CBS uh, doing NFL. They're both excellent broadcasters, he and his son Noah. Noah now works for NBC. And I think that they've decided, you know what? We're going to turn the page. We're not going to ask Al to come in and do this game with a whole new director, producer, and an analyst and sideline reporter that, you know, it's like he's a visitor almost. Let's keep this other crew together and put them on the game. So the, I, I can see it from both sides of, of why they would want to do this and why Al might not want to do this. So, um, look, I, I think um, whatever you read, any quote you get from Al Michaels is a legitimate, authentic quote. So if you see anything out there in Andrew Marchand's column or any other sports uh, television writer's column, you can take it to the bank if, if Al has said it. Um, so I don't want to speak for him, Just, uh, but I, I'm just saying that I will say that having spoken to him this week, he's – in a, in a fine mood and uh, ready to, to finish the season strong on Amazon and do next year. But I do, I, you know, you can certainly see where NBC would say, hey, we've got this up and comer, Noah Eagle. We're developing him. We are, we're, you know, trying to make sure he gets more reps, if you will. And let's keep that crew together and just put that crew on this other playoff game rather than bring Al in for a one-off. So, I, you know, it, I realize it sounds like a massive story, but I think it's less massive than people think. Yeah, I, I did read, and I'm sure you've read it before, but again, this goes to a style thing, and I was kind of surprised at it because I disagree with it fundamentally, I, just to be clear. This uh, suggestion that, you know, executives didn't particularly like one of these big games that, um, I can't remember, it was a Jacksonville game. I think they ended up coming from behind and winning, and Al was calling, and they thought he just didn't really rise to the occasion and, of this remarkable game that had changed hands and led to victory for Jacksonville. And I, I, you know, I, then I listened to a clip of it that they showed as an example. And I thought, well, no, that's just quintessential Al Michaels, not screaming and going crazy. He just, he's a professional broadcaster. I, I don't know. That's a style thing, Michelle. Is there a change well, in the yeah, way they and, want it? And you know, and I think, I think that it, in addition to that, that's what people are guessing is going on here. And having, having been through it with the sports TV media, when I left NBC, I know that they don't necessarily call people for comments. I know that they don't necessarily confirm their stories. And, and back to the first conversation, time. right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's, that's a, well, right. And, and it happened to me. Uh, I was really ill represented in some articles about my, why I was leaving NBC. So People like to go, oh, you know what? I bet it's this. I bet it's because he wasn't so energetic on that Jacksonville game last year. You know, maybe that's part of the reason, but maybe it's not. And did they quote anyone for comment to confirm that, that guess on their part, that, that supposition? So I think that, um, you know, you just got to be careful. <laughs> Read and ask questions. Read and ask questions of yourself. Is do I see a quote here backing this up? Do I see the source here backing this up? I'm I'm not asking about Al. This is I'm now backing away from Al, and I'm asking broadly because uh, there's someone in my mind that I can remember. Uh, this was a radio uh, guy who um, was great at color commentary for years and years, calling football games, and then you know, just he got older and slower, and it was noticeable. And 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 I happened to be privy to conversations where they had to have some tough decisions about this legendary guy stepping away from the mic. Um, I, I guess that's that can happen, though, right? I don't. I guess everybody has yeah. to be sort of honest with themselves when you don't have it anymore. Well, you know, I I, I think Al still has it. Oh, Al think, has it absolutely. Yeah, Al has it. But you, but, but the, the the subject you're talking about right now, I think that's a legitimate conversation. And the great John Madden, whom I had the lovely pleasure of working with for years, uh, chose his time. He chose his time to step down, and I think he just either got advice from people he really trusted or made the decision on his own listening to himself. I don't know why he chose the year he did, but I do know for a fact that he didn't want to stay longer than he should. And, and so he, he took himself off television when he felt it was right. Um, so, I, but, but I think Al is correct, and he still does have it. Yeah, and does. so you can say, you know, that one game last year, a playoff game, if you weren't satisfied with it, how many times, how many Emmys has Al won? How many times has he absolutely nailed the moment? So, right. um, but, but yeah, I think, I think this is just a signal 
that they are really excited about Noah Eagle and they're moving in that direction. We've had a conversation before about kind of the change. I mean, all of us are, you know, you're doing digital work and podcasting. I am too. You know, the traditional broadcast medium has changed. Al Michaels, now for heaven's sakes, is on Amazon. Uh, now, now with some time in this thing where we're doing streaming games and things like that, what's your read now that it's shaken out a little bit? Is it is it working? Um, is the football world better for uh, streaming and diversifying or not? Or how do you read it all? I think that so many things are going to be streaming. I think that even now, like here in where I live, we can't watch Sunday night football on our NBC station. We have to watch it on Peacock because there's some sort of disagreement right now between NBC, the network network and, and the carriers that we have. And so it's really ridiculous. So I think that we're going to see streaming become more and more prevalent I think with live sports, there will always be a place on, not, I shouldn't say always, but there will still be a place for quite a while on broadcast television because that's what the majority of the country has. I think one thing that is helping streaming a lot are these devices now, these remotes, where you can just say to your remote, show me Yellowstone, and they, boom, Paramount comes on on your screen and you're watching Yellowstone. Or show me Thursday Night Football and, boom, Amazon Prime opens up on your screen And here it comes. I think those developments are essential because people trying to navigate all of these apps on the smart TVs and get to the place they want, it can be frustrating for some. So they've just got to, I think the more they streamline that process, the easier they make it for the user, the better. I say this all the time about um, the talk radio audience. You know, I've done talk radio now for, I don't know, over 20 years. And it's, I'm caught in the middle. I mean, I'm a 40, almost 47 year old guy. So, you know, my parents still with us. I love them. They're great. But like you say, um, to, to stream something, to download a podcast, to click on an app, that still kind of confuses them a bit. You got to really talk yeah. them through it. They prefer to be able to turn on a switch and the radio be on or the TV be on. But then my kids, Michelle, they haven't listened to a live broadcast on a radio or a television of anything ever. They think that's like other planet stuff. It's a weird time we're in, you know. <laughs> It is. We're sort of right in the middle of it, right? Yeah. And, and you're so right. Um, you and I are kind of in that same. I, I'm a little older than you. <laughs> but the thing is that I do have two teenagers who never watch TV. And no. they can start. They can start watching a game. My son will start. And then he'll wander off and go do something and know that he can always check in on the score online anytime he wants or on his device, just look at his phone and he'll know. So, yes, it's it's a very it generationally a very different thing. My concern is that, you know, the attention deficit disorder we're going to have as a, as a collective society is going to be pretty, pretty stark. Do you <laughs> still be ugly? Do you still pay attention to the news of, of, of the league in particular, NFL in particular? I, not as much as I did when I was working in it, because I'm so now fascinated by other things and so involved. But I do I, just kind of out of curiosity, I specifically the high profile kind of fall here lately of Bill Belichick. Um, I'm sure over the years you had caused to cross paths with him. How do you read that? <laughs> Just a few times. <laughs> uh, yes. I, 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 I've dealt with Bill many, 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 many times. We covered the Patriots a lot. Um, so it's, it's not been a pretty season. And I think that there is some daylight now between, if I had to guess, between Bob Kraft and Bill Belichick. And Bob probably wants to turn the page. Kraft is an incredibly competitive, proud man. And he does not want his tenure with the Patriots to be going in this direction at this stage in his life. So I think he'd like to rebuild. I don't know where you go. When you say we're going to get rid of Bill Belichick, okay, who are you bringing in? This is the, this is the question I would urge everyone to ask when they suggest a coach should be fired. Who are you going to get? Who is out there that you're going to get who will do a better job? Bill Belichick is proven. Uh, things aren't good right now. He doesn't have Tom Brady. He doesn't have a lot of the talent he used to have. But other teams are making moves. And so, yeah, I think that as an owner, you do have to ask yourself, well, what do I have to do to get back on the winning track? And if that means a, a, a full-scale overhaul, then, then maybe that's what Bob Kraft does. Um, so it's going to be very, very interesting. But I don't think it sends – it's sends Bill packing into retirement. I think there's, there are cities, maybe San Diego, I said San Diego, the LA chargers that might want him. Uh, other teams that are making changes might be happy to entertain Bill Belichick. So 
it doesn't necessarily mean the end of his coaching career. It just may mean the end of his tenure with the Patriots. Philadelphia Eagles have this tremendous year, and then they've hit a couple of buzzsaws with uh, the 49ers and the Cowboys. I wonder how you uh, you see the NFC shaking out if you're still following. Like I say, that's why I asked in advance. Yeah, I don't know if you're no, following or not. I, I totally am. Um, you know, uh, several weeks ago, someone asked me for my Super Bowl favorites. And I, at the time, you know, like I said, this was several weeks ago. And I thought, I feel something about the 49ers. Can I actually be saying that when Brock Purdy is the quarterback of the 49ers? <laughs> But look at what they're doing. Yeah. They have given him so much to work with. So, um, and, but at the same time, I was saying, why is why does no one seem to want to really believe in Philadelphia? Yeah. Well, I think Philadelphia is a very very good team. Um, I think the NFC is looking really interesting, and so I'm going to stick with my pick on the 49ers side in the NFC. And I'm really not sure about the AFC. You always want to point to the Kansas City Chiefs because of Patrick Mahomes and and every weapon that he has. Uh, but, you know, there are some interesting storylines developing, and it's really a different-looking league. The landscape yeah. of talent and of the teams that are standing out is very different. Baltimore is very interesting. And so, you know, it, but the thing is, now you can start sort of making more credible uh, predictions because we're late in the season. You know, four weeks ago, five, six weeks ago, you think you know stuff, but you don't know, or you think you know stuff, and then Joe Burrow gets a season-ending injury. So <laughs> it's just, you know, it's that's the thing about this league. But I think now we're at, we're at a place where we can start seeing it shape up. You brought up the Chiefs. I'll let you go on this one because it's an interesting – I know you've probably seen the call – last week, uh, off offensive offsides um, yeah. that uh, blew up a, a pretty remarkable play at the end of a, a series there for Kansas City. Uh, Buffalo wins that game. Andy Reid, in a really rare moment for Andy Reid, uh, said he thought the league was embarrassed by that flag. And, of course, Mahomes threw a yeah. tantrum and says he regrets it now. But um, I, I know that's not the first time you've heard an official blew a game. What are your thoughts on that? Well, when you look at the film – that the film never lies, yep. and it was he was offside. Yep. It, it, it it was frustrating for for the Chiefs, I'm sure, because it was a brilliant play, and they are so good, the Chiefs, at coming up with these bizarre formations and executions of plays. It's so that that's one of the things that makes them so much fun. But the guy was offside. He was by a mile. So, you know, usually what happens is when you're lined up at receiver, you look to the line judge and you say, am I lined up okay? I don't know how this one got away from everyone, but the fact of the matter was he was way offside. They gave him an advantage that affected the play. Um, so as much as people want to say they got ripped off, the film doesn't really lie. Yeah. Did, did you ever did you ever think in your mind in your time covering football? Because you, you hear it almost every close game that officials – gave it to a team for one reason or another. Yeah. Did you ever think that? And you're, you don't have to name a game, but, I mean, was there ever a time where you thought, boy, the officials seem like they really were, were inter interfering there in a meaningful way? You know, I, I have never thought that intentionally an official was doing something, but there certainly are times where you're like, really? I, you know, th some ticky-tack calls or a call in a major moment, but... That one was pretty obvious. Sure. So, uh, you know, I, if it doesn't get called and you're Buffalo and you end up losing the game on that play where it's a no call, you have just as much reason to be upset, right? Yep. So it, it goes both ways. As much as people want to get angry at the officials, um, the thing that really bothers me about officiating right now is how long it takes, how long it takes to review some of these plays and that we can't just call a touchdown and have it be a touchdown. They've got to review every scoring play. It takes a lot of excitement out of the game, in my opinion. And, and so it's just one of, those, one of those parts of the game that is human, and we have to deal with it. I, I always enjoy catching up with you, and I, this was a great reason to do so. But uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll let you go and uh, encourage everybody to listen to your podcast because it's about so much more than Thank football. Uh, I happen to be just a, a yeah, fan, yeah. and I, a fan of your work. But uh, yeah, you do anything in particular that we can listen for coming up, or that you know is on the docket oh, in the few, next few weeks, or? Yeah, well, next week I'm having a guy named Jake Beckett on, and speaking of this, he played for the Patriots. He's also a former Army Ranger and now a political guy. And he's really, really interesting. And I'm looking forward to talking to him about, yes, the Patriots, but also 
uh, just about, um, you, you know, you hear so many things about sports going woke, as it were. And, and I want to talk to him about being someone from the inside and what he really saw among the players. And are, are, are all the players really the way they're being portrayed? Is there division in the locker rooms? Those kind of things. So I want to get into some social and political issues with him as well. Michelle Tafoya, it's her podcast. Do not miss it. Part of the Salem Podcast Network family. Great to call you colleague and friend. And Michelle, I wish you a Merry Christmas to you and your family. Merry Christmas to you and all your listeners. Thank you. The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.